And now look in John chapter number 2, if you're there, say amen. amen. John chapter 2, verse number 13. Let's, uh, let's see what God's Word has to say for us, see if we can get something from it, amen. It says in verse number 13, uh, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and was found in the temple of those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the uh, changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews, and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us? seeing thou, that thou doest these things. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. It's one of my favorite quotes of the Lord Jesus, which we'll talk about. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you again, Lord, just for this morning, God. I look forward to all that's to follow. Pray, Lord, you'd bless our time of fellowship, the time of, uh, uh, Lord, uh, uh, food and, and whatnot. God, uh, bless our conversations. May they be edifying, encouraging, and exhorting to one another. And uh, God, I pray that you'd help us for a few minutes, Lord, to pay attention, God, our hearts to be open to receive your word. And God, give us something that'll help us down the road, I pray in Jesus Christ's name. And amen. Amen. A lot of you know that John is recording um, what many uh, commentators claim is Jesus' second time purifying the temple or cleansing the temple. A lot of commentators think that there were two cleansings. Um, some say only one. But uh, regardless, uh, what's going on here is God's people, uh, the, the Jews, they're the Pharisees and Sadducees, that, and, and just the children of Israel in general, are using God's temple as a place to make money. Uh, they're using God's temple as a place to network and build up social relationships, to socialize, to make money, uh, to take advantage of people. Um, they were literally, you come to the uh, to sacrifice and it's kind of it's kind of like what we do today as far as getting everything nice quick and easy uh, they'd say you come to the temple and if you need an offering or a sacrifice we got one right here for you and uh, they'd give you a price and, and what you can do is is whenever a person is in a need of desperation if there's a great need there's a desperate need there you can charge more for it so what they were doing is, is people were coming to the temple for holidays and the, the seasons and different things like that and the different feasts, and they were saying, oh, look, you really need this. You need this pigeon or you need this, this, this oxen or whatever it is. And they were making money off the people that were in need of a sacrifice or just in need of, of animals in general and cattle. And uh, Jesus obviously rebukes them and says, this is, you made it a place of merchandise, but it's supposed to be a house of prayer. He said, my father's house is a house of prayer. And John records his gospel around 60 AD. It's later than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I believe a lot of you already know this, but the reason why whenever you and I read the book of John, it relates so much more to us than Matthew, Mark, or Luke, is that that word belief keeps coming up. Believe, 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 believe keeps coming up. Because John's writing this, this gospel here after Paul's revelation has been revealed. So Paul's writing it with that viewpoint in mind. And uh, what's interesting is that since he records it later than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and more time goes by, and, and the, the early church meets in the book of Acts and hashes out some doctrines for the local church, and, and Paul's preaching and teaching, and now Peter's to the circumcision. Now John is right, sitting down to pen this letter, and he has a great strength that the other three disciples, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, did not have. He has a great advantage that the other three did not have. Whenever he's going to write his letter about Jesus and the works of Jesus, he has something to his advantage. You know what it is? It's hindsight. John has the gift of hindsight. <laughs> Whenever Matthew, Mark, and Luke are recording, I don't know if they were recording it while Jesus was going around and doing these wonderful works or if it was just shortly after his death. I, I don't know, but I know this John lets some time goes by. He gets to meddle and to, to think on these things and to synthesize the information, to synthesize all the works of God and to, to synthesize what the, the early church has done throughout the book of Acts. And now John's writing down his epistle and he has the awesome gift of hindsight. One could even argue that you're better off waiting until time has passed before you start speaking about a subject. You might be able to give a better synopsis of everything that went down. And, and in hindsight, hindsight is a powerful tool. Hind, hindsight's a powerful tool. Uh, speaking of tools, any of y'all, I don't know if you, men or women, you ever try to do something around the house and you need a screwdriver? You just need a simple Phillips head screwdriver. That's all you need. And you know you have one. You know the color, you know you can see it somewhere in the house, you just don't know where it is, but you see it on the cabinet, you go and look in that cabinet, and you're going around and just to finish this simple job of changing out the batteries or whatever it is, you just need this Phillips, but you cannot find it. 
You can't find it. And someone has the audacity to ask you the question, well, where'd you leave it? And you're thinking, well, genius, that's what we're all thinking right now. We're, right now, we're all thinking, where did I leave it? We don't know where I left it. If I knew where I left it, I wouldn't be looking for it. I'd know where it is, and I'd go find it. But you, you, that one tool, or, or ladies, you might start a, a project or a, something in the kitchen, and you're cooking, you're cooking up a storm, and you got flour on, and you got grease on you and everything, and your apron's dirty, and there's one ingredient that you need. And all of a sudden, you start hearing those cabinets open and close with a little more force. Amen. Those cabinets are closing. You can't find that one ingredient that you need, and now you've got to go to the store. And get that ingredient. You know you have it somewhere. Fellas, you, you start to work on, around the house. You're doing a, a remodeling job or whatever it is. I mean, you've got to go to Lowe's 10, 15 times to get the tools that you can't find. Point being, you do the job. You cook the meal. And weeks later, you're going through your cabinets. You're going through your dressers and cabinets. And there's that tool you needed. And there's the ingredient that you needed. You had it all along. You just didn't find it until later on. You know hindsight is kind of that way? Hindsight is the answer to everything that you have questions about right now. The, you, you, believe it or not, everything that you're wondering in your heart and your mind, whatever it is, whether it's how God's going to bring to pass this situation, how God's going to solve this problem, how God's going to do this work, how God's going to work this out, why is God allowing this to happen, you already have the answers. Here's the thing. Hindsight doesn't show up until later. And a lot of times, the very thing that you realize that God was doing, the very thing that you realize, that the, the, the answer, the solution to your problems, hindsight is 20, 20 it's perfect vision. You can always tell down the road why God was working a certain way, why God was moving a certain way. But the problem is that you don't really get hindsight until later on. And here in John chapter 2, John says something to the Jews, or Jesus says something to the Jews, and the disciples hear it. And what Jesus says to them, it, get this, it goes completely over their head. It goes completely over their head. <laughs> Look what he says to them. He says this in verse number 19. They said, verse 18, they said, give us a sign. What's a sign that you're going to do these things? And this is his sign to them. He, he doesn't give them a sign. He gives them some scripture. He says something to them. He goes, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And you know what happens? He says that to his disciples, and it just goes whew, right over their head. <laughs> It even says that they don't get what he's talking about. The Jews say 40 and 6 years was this temple and building. Wilt thou rear it up again in three days? And then John puts this in there because he's looking at hindsight. He goes, but he spake of the temple of his body. And then notice this in verse 22. When therefore he was risen. So this is after the resurrection. John's writing this after Christ died. He says, after he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto him. And then look, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Jesus Christ is getting ready to say one of the greatest statements, I, I believe, that in his ministry here on earth, one of the greatest statements that Jesus Christ says is, I will destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And it just goes shoo, right over their head. They don't understand it. And I was going to ask some of you in here this morning, I was going to ask you, do any of you, do, 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 do things tend to just go right over your head? Do you not understand them? And I was going to ask you all that question, but it may go over your head. I mean, you might not understand what I'm even asking you, but the disciples here, Jesus is... Jesus is saying something to them, and it's, it's one of his, his greatest statements. He's saying, I'm going to resurrect myself by my own spirit. I am the Son of God. I am God. I am God in the flesh. And by my own spirit, I am going to, no man uh, taketh my life. I lay it down, and I lay it down, and I have power to raise it up again. Jesus Christ is saying, I'm going to resurrect myself. That's a profound statement. One of the three greatest events in your Bible, you have the incarnation in Christ, you have uh, God coming down and, and becoming like man, becoming a man, you have uh, God dying for the sins of man, and then thirdly, God resurrecting himself from the grave. <laughs> Those are three of the greatest events in your whole Bible. And Jesus is talking about the resurrection, the thing that gives mankind victory over the death and the grave and sin itself. And they miss it. And you and I sit here in 2023 and we're thinking, Peter, James, John, how did you guys not get this? <laughs> this is so simple. What do you mean you don't get the, resur the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's the greatest event in all the Bible, that he got up from the dead three days later. And we get to go tell people this is the Son of God. This is, the Messiah. this is him. This is the Christ. You guys are missing that? In John chapter 2, they're not getting it. <laughs> they're not getting it. This is such a profound statement. I was doing this in my, in my reading this morning. I'm going through the book of Mark, and I never realized this, but this is one of the only statements that whenever they're accusing Christ before um, uh, uh, Caiaphas and, um, and Herod and the different ones, it's one of the only statements that they actually bring up of what Jesus said. 
You can study on your own. Look in, over Matthew 26 sometime. Look in Mark 14. You can find it. This is one what the, the false accusers that are trying to claim that Christ should be put to death. These are one of the only statements that they bring up that says this makes him worthy of death. The fact that he said he's going to destroy this temple and in three days raise it up again, it's also one of the only things that they use in in Mark chapter 15 and Matthew 27 when they're making fun of Christ up on the cross. It's one of the only two statements that they say they're repeating what he said. And it says they wag their heads, they shook their heads at him, and they say, you're going to destroy the temple in three days, huh, and raise it up again. Well, go save yourself. This statement struck such a strong chord with the Jews, and it pricked them so greatly, and get this, They didn't even understand what he was saying to them. And Jesus' own disciples, John tells you and I, that after he was risen from the dead, then they go, oh, that's what he was talking about. (laughs) Whenever he said he's going to destroy the temple, oh, okay, now it makes sense what he was saying. Before then, I had no idea. (laughs) Ain't it funny the things you realize later on down the road? Ain't it funny the things that you understand, not in the moment, but later on after it all happens. Man, hindsight, it can, it can sneak up on you. It can almost make you laugh at times. They get it all afterwards. They had the, they, if they, only they had hindsight like you and I do from the Word of God. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that God gives us His Word where you and I can have hindsight right now. This Bible, what it does is, is it gives you and I hindsight. We can look back at the past and see how God dealt with men and how God dealt with nations. And hindsight from the past gives you and I insight into the present and into the future. Understanding how God worked with people from the Word of God and how God worked with men, how He worked with women, how He worked with children, how He worked with the church, how He worked with the nations. Understanding, having hindsight of the past gives you insight into the present and into the future. And it helps you and I understand what God's doing, not just with mankind, but what He's doing with you and I personally. You all have heard the the phrase, history just repeats itself. And sadly, what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. And the disciples were often not understanding what God was saying in the moment. And notice, they often did not understand what God was doing in the moment. Half the time when Jesus Christ was preaching, the disciples go, what do you mean there's a sower that went forth and sowed and it fell on this and it fell on that? And then it says he explained it to his disciples. Jesus goes by and he curses a fig tree. And Peter goes, why are you cursing the fig tree? They don't get what he's doing. Half the time while Christ is doing things throughout the Gospels, the 12 disciples have no idea. They don't even get what he's trying to say or what he's trying to do. But I'll say this, they got it all later. They got it later. They understood later on what Christ was doing. And I I don't know if you want to title a message. I don't know if you like titles. Uh, You could title it farther along or you could title it this, you'll get it later. You'll get it later. (laughs) I want to preach just a few few on that thought of you'll get it later. You'll get it later. You ever say something to somebody and they don't understand it and you're thinking you'll get it later. You'll understand what I'm saying later. Amy Carmichael, uh, later on, uh, before I get to that, later on it'll all make sense. Later on it'll all come together. Later on down the road you'll understand it a little bit more. Like the song said, farther along, you'll know more about it. Farther along, you'll understand. As you get down the road, man, of life and through the road of time and into eternity, some things might not be answered until you get to eternity. You will understand it one day. It will all make sense. It will all come together and you'll realize that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. According to His purpose. Amy Carmichael, I'll open this up and then we'll get into a couple places in Scripture to learn this lesson and see it brought out. But uh, Amy Carmichael, I, I read a, a biography on her recently and there's a chapter named, uh, I forget what the chapter was called, but it's something about beautiful blue eyes. Beautiful blue eyes. And Amy Carmichael, uh, she used to pray. She had brown eyes. And as a little girl, five and six-year-old girl, her mommy, I believe, had blue eyes. And she used to pray, Mommy, Mommy, I want blue eyes. I want blue eyes. And she'd pray to Jesus saying, Jesus, please, I want beautiful blue eyes. I don't want my ugly brown eyes. And she was praying that one day. And her mom said, uh, she said, Amy, she goes, what are you talking about? She goes, God made you beautiful. And she goes, no, Mommy, I want blue eyes. I want to be pretty like you. And uh, Amy said, well, will you pray that God will change your eye color? Amy's mom said, you pray that God will change your eye color. And, and Amy went and prayed that prayer. And she woke up the next day, went excited into the mirror and looked, and her eyes were still brown. And she went out to her mom and she said, Mommy, Jesus didn't answer my prayer. Jesus didn't answer my prayer. And Amy's mother says, no, honey, he did. He told you no. He did answer your prayer. He said he wants you to keep your brown eyes. And life went on with Amy Carmichael. I can't go through everything that she went through and all that she did. She went over to Japan for a little while, I believe it was, or somewhere over near China. I was a missionary there for a couple years with somebody. Ended up going back to England, I believe, and then coming back down to India where she'd spend the rest of her life and got sick and everything like that. But she had neuralgia, nerve pain throughout her whole life. Would, uh, for a couple months at a time, would have to take a leave, of, you know, go, and go off to another place and, and rest and relax and be bedridden for months at a time, get her energy back and go. But 
One day, she started getting into rescuing young girls from the uh, Hindu, from the sex trafficking that was going on. And uh, she found out that what they do over there, they're real, per- they're real perverted. Some of them still do it, but uh, they, they would, these girls would get married at 10, 11 years old, even before they hit puberty, sometimes younger than that, and they'd go off and marry these men. Sometimes the men would be 50 and 60 years older than them. And if the man dies, uh, which Amy Carmichael talks about a story about that, and it may, a 60-some-year-old man married a little 10-year-old girl. He died immediately in their first year of marriage. She had to be a widow for the rest of her life. Their widows have to stay inside of an inner room. They're not allowed to go out in the community. They have to hide their face from society for the rest of that little girl's life. Anyways, uh, thank God you're, you're not in that culture. But uh, she started rescuing these girls from the sex tra- trafficking. And uh, what she did was she wanted to go into the temples to try and see what was going on. So in order to do that, she had to dress up with camouflage. So she had to put on the, 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 the gowns that they wear, the hats that they wear and everything like that. And she took some brown mud and, and painted her skin and actually made her look darker like she was a Hindu. And I remember when her, she, she, they, they said, while I was reading, she was getting ready to, to, to go out. And she goes, lady, she goes, how do I look? And they said, oh, Miss Amy. They said, Miss Amy, they go, we would have no idea that you were a white woman. We'd have no idea that you were an English woman. You look just like us. And they said, good thing you have brown eyes like we do. And they said, Amy Carmichael, Amy said she started walking out that door. And before she got to open the door, she said she just stopped. And she goes, and, her, and it says her mind went back to a little girl that was praying, God, give me blue eyes. God, give me blue eyes. And she realized not until 40 or 50 years later that God had a purpose down to her very eye color. God had something special for her very eye color. And you were talking about the hairs of your head being numbered. Talk about the color of your eyes. There was a purpose behind everything that went into Amy Carmichael's life and her upbringing. And God had a specific purpose for it that she didn't find out until years down the road. She got it later. She got it later. And you know what will happen in your, your life and my life? There are things that you will go through that you will not understand. You won't understand why God is working that way, why He is waiting that way. And it will not make sense to you, the things that He has promised you. And time will go by and you'll say, God, what is your purpose in all this? What is your, what, what's your plan in all this? And I, I'm promising you, I, I promise you upon God's Word, church, you'll get it later. You'll get it later. It'll all, it may not make sense to you now, it'll make sense to you later. Isaiah 46, if you want to turn there, you can. I'm going to read it. But Isaiah 46, for the sake of time, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things, those of long ago. Isaiah 46, 9. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, which is still to come, from ancient times to which is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. God Almighty said, I know the end from the beginning. I know that which was and that which is. And he says, and I will perform my purpose and I'll bring to pass that which I, that, all that I please. God knows the end from the beginning. He has a purpose for everything that he does and God does not waste energy. <laughs> you all ever do something in life, whether it's a job around the house or just something in your life, whatever it is, man, you think, man, I just wasted an hour. I just wasted an hour of my time doing that. I wasted so much time, so much energy, so much money, whatever it is. God never wastes time, money, or energy. And sometimes in your life and my life, it feels like, God, what's taking you so long? Come on already. We're trying to get the ball rolling. We're trying to get this thing going. I'm trying to bring this thing to pass, this good work to pass. God, what is taking you so long? He's not wasting time. He's not wasting energy, and he's not wasting resources. You ever, sometimes it feels like the Lord's wasting time and energy, but he's not. God, why aren't you having me do something better than this? Why are you waiting so long to bring it to pass? You know the Jews, they looked at Jesus in that way. And a lot of them didn't even believe that he was their Messiah because he didn't show up with all the great, wonderful things that they wanted. (laughs) They wanted their kingdom now, and he didn't come with their kingdom right now the way that they wanted it. He just went around and took his good old time. He grew up as a boy, did carpentry for around 15 years. He went around for about three, three and a half years, teaching and preaching and healing and resurrecting the dead, and that's all he did. And that wasn't enough for a lot of them. They had Christ with them, they had God with them, they had God in the flesh with them, working with them, and you know what they said? They said, we want more, we want more, we want more. They weren't satisfied just sitting down and eating with the king. They weren't satisfied, man, with just hearing his words taught, with seeing the miracles that he did. They wanted more, they wanted more from him, they wanted more from him. And something that you and I have to be careful of is saying, God, you owe me more. You need to come through in this situation now. You owe me this answer, you owe me this blessing. No, man, just enjoy the time with him. Wherever you are, man, if you're in the pit or if you're in the prison or if you're on the mountaintop or if you're down in the valley, man, just enjoy being there with the Lord. 
Just enjoy it with your family, man. Enjoy it with your ministry. Just enjoy it. Jeremiah 29 verses 11 and 13 say this, For I know the Lord said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, the thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29 11 says, you, I have to, I've given you an expected end. God knew exactly when their captivity was going to end. And He knew when He was going to liberate them. And He knew how. He knew how He expected it. And He knew how He was going to bring it all to pass. But it took 70 years for God to bring it to pass. God hadn't expected it. And God knows how, how to bring your and I's problems, our captivities, to an end. He knows how to take care of our problems, and He will. And I just want to, we're, we're not even going to turn to these, but I'll just show them to you up here on the screen in case you like taking notes. Four different people, four different places where you find, you find people who got it later. <laughs> people who probably understood it all later on, but in the moment they didn't have any idea, or maybe they didn't fully understand what God was doing with them. Number one, Noah was one character that you can show throughout plenty of people in the Bible, but let me give you these four. Noah, I bet you Noah, whenever he's preparing that ark back in Genesis 6, 7, and 8, and the floods are going on, I know what God told him, but do you think Noah really understood everything that God was doing with him? Think of this, Noah, I'm going to flood the whole earth. I want you to build a boat. I want you to take two of every kind of animal, and they're going to get on the boat with you. And you take your wife, you take your children, and their wife, you take your sons and their wives, and you all get on the boat. And Noah, you and your children are going to, are going to inherit the whole earth. You think Noah thought, that makes perfect sense, Lord. Okay, let's do it. I bet Noah said, okay, Lord, may, okay, I'll, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. You ever think of this? You ever think Noah's sitting out there building a boat for 75 years and bringing wood and bending the wood and having animals, you know, with oxen, taking that wood and putting a, a big metal or a big, a big beam down and then have to take that wood and kind of bow it a little bit and have an oxen pull on this side, an oxen pull on this side, and have Ham, Shem, and Japheth, you know, holding that wood there, and they bend that big piece of wood because it's going to go there at the front of the ark, and then they're going to put that up there with the, 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 the sticky stuff that they made. You think whenever he's doing that for 75 years, you think the thought ever came by, Lord, could you help me out? Could you, come on, I'll build a boat big enough for this, but can you help me out a little bit? You're going to make me work 75 years to bring this thing to pass? I bet you while he's sitting there working, he's sitting there preaching to the people and he's, he's lifting up his voice and his sons are preaching, and his daughter-in-laws are preaching, his wife is preaching, hey, a flood's coming, a flood's coming, get in the ark, get in the ark, put, repent, believe on God, and none of them are listening. I bet you he thought, Lord, am I preaching the right message? What dispensation am I in right now? What should I be doing? How should I be going about this thing? Because no one is coming to me. I'm, I'm preaching. No one's getting right. No one is believing. On Jude tells you that he's a preacher of righteousness. I believe it was. No one is believing the words that I'm saying. Am I even doing this the right way? Am I doing it the right way? So what, what is going on? I, I promise you. I promise you. He was a man. And I promise you Noah was thinking those things. But I bet you, Brother Harold, when that door was finally shut, and all of a sudden they started hearing on the roof of that ark, drip, drip, drip trickle, 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 and they heard the earth open up and water come gushing up out of it, I bet you Noah thought, oh, I get it now. I get it now. And that water kept coming. He started hearing the screams and the cries of everyone else that was living a wicked life, everyone else that didn't get inside the ark, everyone else that was just, just mocking them and laughing at them. And they're all sitting outside there, stressed out, worried, anxious, fearful, clawing on the sides of the ark. And Noah's there in safety with his little family. I bet he said, okay, Lord, I get it now. I get it now. 1 Peter 3.19 says, Which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing. Noah got it later while he prepared the ark. While he was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. <laughs> when Noah was safely inside that boat, I bet you he got it then while he was preparing that ark for 75 years. And you say, Aaron, he didn't save the whole world. No, but he saved his family. I bet you Noah said, that's good enough for me. I wish I could have saved the whole world, but if I can just keep my family, thank the Lord. I bet you Noah understood it all later. I bet you he got it later. He understood why he prepared that ark. Joseph, I bet you in Genesis, I bet you he got it later, why he had so many people problems. Why he had so many people problems. Bad relationships, man. If you want to talk about somebody with bad relationships, go study Joseph. Joseph's brethren throw him in the pit. And then his boss, Potiphar, uh, believes his, his boss's wife there uh, and uh, puts him inside the prison. And then his co-workers, the baker and the butler, they throw him underneath the bus. You remember the story? They're there in prison with him. 
And Joseph says, whenever you get out, make sure you tell them about me, remind them about me. And the one of them, I don't know if it's the baker or the butler, they get out and they forget about Joseph. He had co- co-worker problems. He had a problem with his boss. He had a problem with his brethren. He had a problem with all of them. Man, he had some people problems. And in Genesis 50, verse 20, mark it down. Genesis 50, verse 20, But as for you, Joseph says to his brethren, Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Joseph's finding out that all of his people problems were so that he could save a lot of other people. He's going to end up saving the Egyptians that put him in prison. He's going to save his brethren that put him in the pit. And you may, you may not understand this, man, but what God does is He teaches you lessons through other people. And what He'll do is, is He'll have somebody that you love hurt you. You want to know why? So you can deliver someone else that's going to be hurt by somebody that they love. He'll have brethren hurt you with their words. Why? So you can help someone else that's hurt by the brethren. Joseph's going to save his brethren. He's going to save the, the heathen that threw him into prison. God's going to use his past relationships, his past people problems to help deliver others. And he got it all later. I promise you, he understood it all later. And child of God, you'll get it all later. You'll get it later. You may not understand it in the moment. You'll get it later. I promise you. Job is another man. Job's another man. Job, verse 38, or chapters 38 through 41. Job got it later. Why he had so many partings. Why he had so many partings. Joseph had a part with a lot in the Bible. He had a part with his servants that were slain. He had a part with his health. He had a part with his finances. He had a part with his children. He had a part with a good relationship with his wife. They stayed together, but man, when your wife comes up to to, to you and tells you to curse God and die, uh, you may not look at her the same. He understood God's purpose behind it all. If you study the book of Job in chapters 38 through 41 and 42, Job gets it all later. It makes sense to him. Job spends almost 35 chapters trying to figure out why. He spends 35 chapters with his buddies, and they're they're all giving him reasons as to why this is happening to him in his life. He's trying to figure out why this is happening to him in his life. And you want to look over in the book of Job. Look over in Job, uh, I think it's um, 40. Job 40. Job's right before the book of Psalm. Look in Job chapter 40. Jo- Joseph learned why he had so many people problems. Noah learned later, he got it later, why he was preparing an ark. Look in Job chapter 40 and look at why God allowed all those things to happen to Job. Job finally figured it out. Verse number 3, it says, Then Job answered the Lord. This is the first time Job speaks. After, Jesus, or after God asked him around 80-some plus questions that Job couldn't answer. Job answered the Lord and said this, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? You know what God wanted to show Job? Job, Job, you're imperfect. And your knowledge is limited. But Job, I'm perfect. My knowledge is not limited. And Job, I'm still in control. You know the book of Job, it's that great question that everybody tries to act like it's some great philosophical deep question that nobody can understand. No, you can understand it. You can have knowledge of it in your head. Whether it ever sinks down your heart or not, that's another story. But why do the righteous suffer? Because the righteous are living in a sin-cursed world. Righteous people doing righteous things like Job that are leading their family, leading their wife, leading their their servants. Righteous people doing right suffer because they are in a sin-cursed world. And God's purpose behind it all is to remind Job that he's still a sinful man and in a sinful world and he has a limited understanding that God knows all things and Job knows so little. God's purpose is to remind Job that God's still in control and that God can still turn even the worst of situations around. God's going to end up giving Job more than what he had in the very beginning. And I'm telling you this, church, Job got it all later. It made sense to him later. He didn't get it in the moment, but he got it all later. He got why he had so many partings in his life and why God took people out of his life. He's going to give him more than what he ever had before. And he wants to show that you can be faithful through trial and tribulation and that God's all-knowing, God's all-powerful, and God's still in control. And then lastly, another group of people that got it later... They didn't get it in the moment was the disciples, were the disciples. The disciples got it later. They understood it later. The power and the person of Jesus Christ. The power and the person of Jesus Christ. They, they realized there in John chapter number 2, whenever he says that, he says, I will destroy this temple and in, in three days I'll raise it up again. They didn't get what he was talking about or who he was talking about. And I think it's funny, that it goes right over their head. He was trying to get them to see, I'm going to die, and I'm going to resurrect my own body on my own. You know other people were raised from the dead throughout the Gospels, but no one ever did it on their own. Jesus is getting ready to show that he's going to do this by himself, and they kept doubting him. 
I think it's funny over in John chapter 11, you see the same thing going on. John chapter 11, he goes, he's over there and Lazarus is dead and Mary and Martha are coming to him and they're saying, Lord, he stinketh for three, thou would it's been here. Uh, my brother will not be dead, but now he stinketh. He's been dead for three days, this, that, and the other. They're accusing him of things and everything. And he keeps bringing up the resurrection. And they keep saying, I know, I know about the resurrection. Lord, my brother's dead. And he goes, no, no, no. I am <laughs> the resurrection. I am the resurrection. They go, Lord, I get that in the last days he'll be resurrected from the dead. I get all that. I get all that. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You're missing the point. You're missing who I am. The resurrection is here right now. Quit looking for it down the road. The resurrection is here. I'm here now. You're missing the person and who I am. You're missing my power. You're weeping over something that if you knew who was standing in front of you, if you knew who was with you, if you got it, if it made sense to you, if your eyes would just be open, you would understand that I am the resurrection. I'm here right now. And I got the power to raise up Lazarus. <laughs> and I think if you and I got it, if we truly got it, who was here now? We wouldn't be looking for something later. We wouldn't be saying, God, raise my brother from the dead. God, save the, oh, God, do this. God, do that. God, take care of the situation. No, if you knew that Jesus Christ was with you now, that he loves you, that he is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that you're able to ask or think, that he is the comforter, that he is the Holy One, that he can still save, that he is able to go to save him to the uttermost, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you were to realize it, if you were to get it, <laughs> boy, you wouldn't need hindsight. You just need insight. To realize who is inside of you and who is with you. And like what Brother Aaron talked about, man, to just enjoy being with the King. Because Jesus Christ is saying, man, when are you going to just appreciate who I am and realize who I am? I am God. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the last. And they don't get it. It goes right over their head. They didn't get it. Who was with them in the moment? And you know what you and I do for, just because of how we are? We'll go through a problem and through a trial and come out on the other side, and then we'll look back years later and say, oh, you were with me the whole time, weren't you? I just didn't see you. I'm telling you this, Christian, you'll get it later. You'll get it later who is holding your hand right now, who is in your heart right now, who is in your mind, who wants to be your whole world, who wants to speak to you, talk to you, fellowship with you. You'll get that he is working. He is still all powerful. I promise you, you may not get it now, but you'll get it later. They didn't understand the power of Jesus Christ. They got it later. And I don't know, maybe there's a situation right now in your life that you don't get it. Maybe there's a question that you have that God hasn't given you an answer to. Maybe God's told you to do something and he hasn't brought it to pass yet and you don't get it. But my promise to you is this morning, you'll get it later. Just keep living. Keep going. Keep worshiping. Don't stop. Don't get bitter. Don't get out. Don't get upset, man. Just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep plugging away. If you're down and all that you can do is just swat at the devil and swat at the world and swat at your flesh, just keep swatting. Until somebody comes along and helps you out and takes care of your enemy, man. Just keep fighting. Just keep going. And I promise you, church, you will get it all later. You'll get it later. Like that song says, farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Aren't you thankful that whether you have the answers now or, now or not, you'll have them later. You'll have them later. Amen. Sometimes you just got to take God by faith and say, God, I don't understand you, but I can trust you. I don't understand you, but I can trust you, amen. Why don't you do that this morning? Say, Lord, I'm going to put it in your hands and I'm going to trust that you are in control. Let's spend a few minutes in prayer. To